Right. Well, I think since it's uh, five o'clock and uh, we have an hour, uh, I'd like to get the session started. Um, I'm Charles Melville. I'm currently president of the British Institute of Persian Studies. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Lloyd, uh, Dr. Lloyd Ridgen, who is a reader in Islamic studies at the University of Glasgow's School of Critical Studies. And uh, he's been a long-standing member of the Council of the British Institute and is currently co-editor of our journal, Iran, uh, and has been steering it towards its uh, current successful publication schedule and professionalism. Uh, apart from the couple of books he mentions on his own brief CV that accompanied the advertisement for this talk. He's written many other books and edited also many other books, going back uh, quite a long way now. Uh, the most recent perhaps is Javan Mardi, um, a title I won't attempt to give a word for word single translation for in view of the pitfalls. Uh, and other volumes like uh, The Cambridge Companion to Sufism, She Islam and Identity, 2012, and the most stunning, perhaps, of all, his edited uh, volume, Islam and Religious Diversity, Critical Concepts in Islamic Studies, which I noticed is selling for £975 in Waterstone. So <laughs> selling one of them a month would probably double his salary. <laughs> anyway, uh, and also a very interesting study of Ahmad Kasrabi, who, of course, was... Um, uh, an extraordinarily interesting figure and um, got murdered as a, a consequence of his um, secular and anti-clerical views. Anyway, we're clearly in uh, very good hands to have a lecture on Sufism and uh, particularly what British Orientalists thought about it, which will be um, quite interesting to see because a lot of them, I guess, didn't think about it at all. <laughs> anyway, Lloyd, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. I, I don't think I've ever had such a, a long introduction before, but thank you very much for those uh, kind words. And thank you for the audience for turning up. I can see on the screen now there's 59 participants, which well exceeds what I usually expect to have in, in Glasgow University. Um, but anyway, as you can see, today today's talk is going to be looking at British Orientalisms, looking at how British observers viewed Persian Sufism. And the reason that uh, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. The reason that I took on this um, presentation is because it's part of my teaching in Glasgow University. And uh, basically I was asked to do something and I thought it'd be quite nice to look at Orientalism with a perspective of uh, what happens to Persian Sufism in the 19th century. Of course, we kick off with Edward Said, his 1978 work, Orientalism, was something that I started to read when, when I was an undergraduate student. And I have to admit that it was a text that I didn't really enjoy. Uh, and perhaps it was because I was perhaps a bit naive, a bit green. Um, but also I'm a kind of intuitive person and there's just something that I didn't really enjoy about the text. And I'll say more about that uh, in the conclusion. Anyway, Said's text is all about how to study other cultures. And that is to say the Middle East and Islam had been misrepresented. It had been repressed and manipulated. And perhaps this was consciously uh, manipulated and maybe not. In Said's works, he looks specifically at British and French colonialism and imperialism and this idea of control and dominate. And in his work, he looks at uh, individuals such as Lord Cromer, of course, who was famous in Egypt in the latter half of the 19th century, and Lord Kirsten, who achieved fame in relation to India and Iran. So for Kirsten, the first form of Orientalism is all about control and dominate. It's an explicit conscious form of manipulation. However, the second is uh, perhaps a bit more repressive in the respect that it's all about how we understand and how we represent other cultures. And in this way, all of us are involved in Orientalism. And that's because whatever idea, whatever represent, representation that we have, 
It's all based upon our preconceived ideas, our prejudices, our suppositions, our tastes, and prevailing issues. In other words, in any kind of situation, the ideas that we have about the Orient are never innocent. They always are reflections of our political involvements, our political ideas. So British perceptions of Sufism, by extension, in the 19th century, were never innocent and were never apolitical. So, if we turn to our sources, if we look at the sources that we have about British perceptions of Persian Sufism in the 19th century, we can find that there are five categories. Firstly, we have missionary works. So there's a very famous um, uh, missionary called Henry Martin, who stayed in Shiraz in the beginning of the 19th century. Secondly, in the course of the 19th century, there were all of these translations of Persian Sufi poetry and prose works. And these works included translations of Hafez, Rumi, Nezami, Sa'adi, Umar Khayyam, and Aziz and Asafi. So basically there was an awful lot of material that the British Victorian audience could turn to in its understanding of all things Persian. Thirdly, the British um, readership could turn to histories. In particular, we could look at the ideas of a scholar called Graham, who writes a, one of the first uh, essays on Sufism. And we can also look at the magisterial work of Sir John Malcolm, who wrote the history of Persia and sketches of Persia. Fourthly, we can turn to Sir James Morier, who wrote the fictionist work, work of fiction, The Adventures of Haji Baba of Isfahan. And its popularity uh, is indicated by the fact of we have all these publications, all these editions in the 19th century. And lastly, we can turn to the travel writings, which really took off in the second half of the 19th century. Lady Scheel, Binning, Wheels, Sykes and Brown all wrote major works about their travels and their sojourn in Iran. So those, those are the sources. There's an awful lot of material that the British audience and British readerships could turn to. In short, there are three kinds of ways that British writers viewed Persian Sufism. And these are the three categories that I want to talk about today. So there's the debate on the origins of Sufism and Arianism. Secondly, Sufis were, were portrayed as dirty and libertarian dervishes. And thirdly, we have a more positive perspective of Persian Sufism. These images, by the way, were taken by Sevrugin, who is uh, an, an Armenian photographer in Iran at the turn of the century. Uh, there's some debate about whether these are authentic dervishes or whether they were models who adopted dervish clothing. But even if they were models, it gives you an indication of the kinds of things that he wanted to portray. So, turning firstly to the first way that Persian Sufis were uh, portrayed, and we have this debate on the origins of Sufism and Arianism. Now it all kicks off in the 18th century by William Jones, called the founder of Oriental Studies in the UK. And basically Jones is important because he thought he had discovered a linkage between uh, Sanskrit and Persian and European languages. So it's a philological discovery, if you like, linking the Orient and Europe. But this philological dimension was then taken further by Graham in the respect that he found the origins of Sufism in India. And he saw great similarities between the rituals and the beliefs of the Sufis with the Vedantin tradition in India. This kind of debate was then taken off, uh, then took off in Europe, largely as a result of the theories by uh, French scholars, a French scholar called Gobineau, another philosopher called Ernest Renan. And they took this, uh, this kind of debate about the origins of European civilization and Arianism to a different kind of dimension in the respect that they viewed European civilization as superior. Now, if European civilization was superior, 
by extension, it also meant that there was something superior about this Indo-European civilization as opposed to Semitic civilization. And of course, that's important because, of course, Islam is born in a Semitic environment. So we have scholars, British scholars in the 19th century, such as E. H. Palmer. And in 1867, E. H. Palmer uh, famously said that in a future work, he proposed that he would prove the primeval religion of the Aryan race. Now, these kind of beliefs have been strongly criticized in recent years by uh, an American scholar called Carl Ernst. And Carl Ernst basically argues that what scholars such as Palmer and his like were doing were more or less divorcing Sufism from Islam. So Sufism was quite compatible, if you like, with Western civilization, but Islam wasn't. So it's a false representation, to go back to Said, it's a false representation of what Sufism was really all about. And these ideas of people like Brown were even um, perhaps reflected by uh, the British scholar of Persian studies, E.G. Brown, who died in 1926. And look what he says. He talks about how he imagines a Zoroastrian believer in Iran, how such a Zoroastrian believer must have felt on the Arab Islamic invasion. So he says the Aryan Persian must not only bear the yoke of the Semitic lizard eater, whom he had formerly so despised, but must further adopt his creed and almost indeed his language. However, I don't want to be too harsh on Brown. Uh, a few years subsequent to these comments, he changed his mind. And look at this long quote. He says, had I been called upon to give my opinion on the matter five years ago before writing A Year Amongst the Persians, I should have stated it is my belief that Sufism was essentially non-Muhammadan, if not anti-Muhammadan in character, and that it was the revolt of the Aryan spirit against the Semitic religion imposed by force of arms against an Aryan people. Were I obliged to express an opinion now, I should have to confess that further study and a year sojourn amongst the Persians, during which I enjoyed many opportunities, opportunities of holding prolonged converse with Sufis of every shade of thought, have compelled me, if not altogether to abandon this view, at least to consider it only partially true. And so here we have uh, some images of Palmer and Brown in um, oriental costume. So we've considered the origins of Sufism and Arianism and in the way that it perhaps divorces Islam from Sufism. That's one way that the British Orientalists looked at the Sufi tradition. The second concerns Sufis as dirty and libertarian dervishes. So here I've got some individuals who perhaps are typifying this, this aspect of Orientalism. The first is this missionary, um, Martin, who, as I said before, was in Shiraz in 1812. And you can see that he uh, obviously uh, understood the Sufis as uh, using religion, using Islam, basically to do anything they wanted to do. And Malcolm perhaps takes another uh, 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 um, view, and he says, there can be no doubt that their free opinions regarding its dogmas, their contempt of its forms, and their claims to a distinct community with the deity are all calculated to subvert the belief for which they outwardly profess their respect. So Malcolm says basically that the Sufis are divorcing themselves from Islam. And then a few years later, we have this work by James Moria, and he has a whole chapter in his book, uh, The Adventures of Haji Baba of Isfahan. He has a whole chapter of his book in which he discusses uh, the ideas of the Sufis through certain characters. Now, of course, it is a work of fiction, but nevertheless, it's often argued that Moria bases his fiction upon people that he met in Iran. And again, what's really interesting is that he perceives the Sufis as more or less as charlatans. And typical of this, he even talks about a dervish in this chapter called Dervish Bidin, that is the dervish without religion. <laughs> 
So here we have the kinds of dervishes that were often portrayed as dirty and libertarian. You can see them in, in rags. We'll talk more about the dervishes in rags in the conclusion to this presentation. And then we come to positive perspectives of Persian Sufism. So one of the most uh, important, I think it is Brown, um, Cambridge academic, and he says that basically Persian Sufis are essentialized by travel writers in a negative fashion, but we shouldn't do this. He says, too often it is the case that the traveler, judging only by the opium eating, hashish smoking mendicant, who with matted hair, glassy eyes and harsh raucous voice, importunes the passerby for arms. And he condemns all dervishes as a blemish and a bane to their country. Yet in truth, this is far from being a correct view. Nowhere are men to be met with so enlightened, so intelligent, so tolerant, so well-informed and so simple-minded as amongst the ranks of dervishes. And this kind of perspective is also adopted by um, Percy Sykes. And he talks about his experience of meeting a Sufi at the Shrine in Nain, and he calls him an extraordinary well-read and traveled dervish. It has to be said though, that these kind of views, the positive perspective of Persian Sufis tend to be a minority among all the writings that we have. But nevertheless, these intelligent people uh, say that basically we must forsake this idea of essentializing Persian Sufis. There are many, many different kinds. And lastly, uh, regarding this positive perspective of Persian Sufism, we come across the uh, Chayam mania, which erupted as a result of Fitzgerald's translations of the Rubaiyat. Now, I don't intend to speak too much about uh, Chayam mania, but we all know that by the end of the Victorian period, Fitzgerald had done various translations and the creation of Chayam clubs in London and New York. And it was perhaps the most popular verse in Victoria. Now, some of you may say, well, hang on a minute, Chayam wasn't a Sufi. But what is really quite interesting is that according to the Victorians of the age, of the day, uh, he was indeed. So, for example, this individual, Cowell, who in fact was responsible for giving Fitzgerald a copy of the manuscript in the Bodley Museum, Cowell believed that the poem was mystical and certainly Omar was a Sufi. So, for some people, at least in the Victorian period, Hayam is certainly associated with Sufism and with Persia. Now, so let's go back to Edward Said. What does all this information about how the British Orientalists viewed Persian Sufism, what does all this say about Iran? First point concerns this Aryan discourse. Now, as we've discovered, the Aryan discourse erupted in Europe at the beginning of the Victorian period. But it's not really evident that Iranians themselves pick this up until a few late 19th century intellectuals started to discuss the Arabs in an anti-Arab kind of fashion. And it also has to be said that their views were perhaps limited to a very, very few uh, anti gaja elite intellectuals. But nevertheless, it's there. But it's only until the next generation that these kind of racist views and the views that Iran is somehow linked to the Aryans, that this is picked up and inserted as a form of nationalism. So that by the 1930s, we have such views of Iranian supremacy referring to uh, Aryan discourses, and it's actually included within the school textbooks. So that's the first point, this domestication of the Aryan discourse, it's limited. Secondly, I want to go on to talk about Sufism and the divorce from Islam and how it uh, applies to Iran in the Iranian case in the 20th century. Firstly, there was an individual by the name of Kayvana Ghazvini, and he was inspired by the Theosophical Society. 
Now, this is important because it basically posits the idea that Sufism is not necessarily unique, but perhaps it was inspired by other religious traditions too. So it's a form, if you like, of taking Sufism away from the Islamic, the larger Islamic tradition. Okay. Now, this kind of idea was uh, perhaps advanced by a very famous scholar in Iran called um, Shubhi Abdul Hussein Zaninku, who wrote a very famous work called Two Centuries of Silence, in which he's very, very critical of Islam and in particular the Arabs. You know, in his closing paragraph of the book, he comes out very, very harshly against the Arabs and associates this with a backward form of civilization. But these kind of ideas have been continued. These kind of ideas which try to promote a form of Iranian nationalism through religion and even through Sufism are continued by more respected scholars in Iran. So we can cite the example of Shafi Kadkani, and he has a, a, a book called uh, The History of the Galandaz in Iran, and one chapter of which is called The Iranian Origin of the Sufi Sheikhs. And what is interesting about this chapter is that he discusses this Persian Sufi called Gusheri from the 11th century, and he notes, Gusheri notes, that 93 sheikhs he lists, uh, the majority of whom were 77 were from Iranian territories. Now, this is fine, but he fails to mention that, of course, by the time that Gusheri was writing, Sufism was spread right throughout the Islamic world, and Gusheri was writing from a certain perspective in Nishapur. So it's perhaps inevitable that the sheikhs he listed would have been of Iranian origin. Had he looked at, for example, someone who wrote in, let's say, Tangiers, or someone who wrote in Cairo, I'm sure the list of Sufi sheikhs would have been very, very different. The last example I want to give you comes from a more recent book by a scholar called Milad Milani, and he wrote a, a, a book called Sufism in the Secret History of Persia. Now, Malani himself, to a certain extent, is innocent, but he did endorse the back cover of the book, which was written by Richard Fry, in which we have this comment. It was Iran which introduced Sufism into Islam. Now, this is a kind of view which really pertains to, I think, the, the 19th century. And most modern scholars of Sufism and Islam uh, accept the Islamic uh, influence, the decidedly Islamic influence in the development of Sufism. Thirdly, we have the interesting case of Ahmad Khasravi. Now, what's interesting about Khasravi is that he basically picked up a book by Edward Brown, which he thought was in praise of Sufis. Now, you might think that, according to Said's theories, we have the idea that Persian Sufism is all degenerate and all uh, negative, but here we have Brown praising the Sufis. But nevertheless, Kasafi was someone who said that what Brown was really trying to do was trying to belittle and demonize Iran by the promotion of Sufism, because, of course, Sufism was a tradition which uh, promoted the idea of an otherworldly existence, and we shouldn't engage in society, we shouldn't resist imperialism, and everything will be right in the end. Now, Kasabi was not the first to criticize the Sufis. It had been done before in the generation prior to him, by a certain individual by the name of Mirza Talagani from the, the Democrat Party in Iran in the 1920s. And he insisted that Sadi's poetry, for example, was detrimental to modern ethics. But nevertheless, Kasravi was the first to promote this idea of uh, imperial powers and academics trying to utilize the various religious traditions in Iran to keep Iranian, Iranians weak. Significant here, I think, is that we have this sentence here I've put down, damned if you do and damned if you don't. That is to say, for a British Orientalist from the 19th century, if you say Sufism is good, you're damned. If you say Sufism is bad, 
Again, you're damned. There's no alternative. So, in conclusion, what can we say about this uh, revisiting of Orientalism? What are the problems with the theory? Firstly, we've noted that the travel writers came down very heavily on Sufis because, for example, they were involved in begging and importuning. Uh, and what we can say is that I think this has to be um, taken with some caution in the respect that it doesn't necessarily essentialize Sufism to this dimension of begging. What we have to appreciate is the context in which they were writing. There's no doubt that the travel writers were writing what they saw. And what they saw reflects an economic downturn. And we have to remember that Iran in the 1870s witnessed a terrible famine. There was currency depreciation, rising prices. In effect, people were displaced. And perhaps it was only inevitable that in order to survive, they would engage in begging. But to give their begging a shine of uh, um, authenticity or legitimacy, they adopted some kind of religious um, makeup. And Sufism provided that for them. It was in their tradition, it was in the Iranian tradition to resort to, to religion, to Sufism, if you like, in order to gain a livelihood. Secondly, when we think about Orientalism, we can see that uh, Said and his supporters were people who wanted to more or less blame 19th century writers, 19th century ac academics, in addition to the politicians. The trouble with this is that the 19th century British writers on Sufism were also influenced by Iranian hosts who also had anti-Sufi perspectives. And typical of this is Sir John Malcolm. And he's explicit in his book. In fact, he's a very good scholar. He says, he cites his sources. Malcolm says that he got his information from an individual known as Said Muhammad Ali Behbahani, who has a nickname Sufi Kosh, i.e. The, the Sufi killer, the Sufi murderer. And of course, the clerics in Iran, especially from the Safavid period onwards, have had a reputation or at least some of them, have a reputation of being vehemently anti-Sufi. Thirdly, some people, some or people who endorse Edward Said and his brand of Orientalism, criticize uh, Western academics because they perhaps regard Sufism as exotic, uh, mysterious. That is, they, they glamorize the idea of the other. But again, I think this misses the point of what, what happened in the 19th century in the respect that in terms of literary movements, we can talk about the romantic movements and the romantic poets who basically were looking for representations of universal truth. And the Persian Sufi poetry that was, was translated in the 19th century seemed to vindicate or legitimize their own ideas about the romantic movement. And fourthly, when we think about Said and Fitzgerald, well, I think with, with regard to Fitzgerald, basically he's not trying to represent uh, Persia or Iran or Sufism at all. Fitzgerald didn't see uh, Khayyam as a Sufi. He saw him rather as someone who had a worldview which was based upon these Epicurean ideas. Uh, Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat is probably more about Fitzgerald's own sexuality. You know, he was often, well, he has often been um, classified as a homosexual. It's all about Fitzgerald's class. Fitzgerald himself came from an incredibly wealthy family, but nevertheless, he attempted to divorce himself from his own mother's uh, snob snobbery. Uh, and lastly, uh, Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat is an attempt to divorce himself from the conventions of religion uh, as it was institutionalized during the Victorian period. So in actual fact, rather than see the Rubaiyat as a kind of uh, window to look at Iran or Persia, it's, it's really a window to look at 
Fitzgerald's own life and own position in the challenging uh, environment of Victorian society. And here we have his quote, better a live sparrow than a stuffed eagle. The stuffed eagle, of course, being the real Iran, as it were, and the life sparrow, of course, being his own version of what it meant to be an individual trying to enjoy himself uh, during the 19th century. We all look all these restrictions of Victorian morality. So the term Orientalist perhaps is not really appropriate for Fitzgerald at all. So in conclusion, um, I have to, to, to say, very short uh, conclusion here, I have to say that when we take Edward Said's ideas about Orientalism, yes, there is a lot of worth in them if we look at Iran through the prism, uh, Iran and Sufism, through the, through the prism of origins and Arianism. There is a lot to say there, but in other ways, these ideas of Orientalism need to be challenged and need to be criticised just as the same way that I hope I will now be criticised by you. So thank you very much. And I look forward to some comments and some questions. Thank you very much, Lloyd, for that uh, very stimulating and clearly presented talk. Um, we've got one or two questions already, so I shan't abuse my position other than by repeating them for you. Um, I should just say, first of all, if anyone has questions, please stick them in the Q&A and I'll do my best to decant them all to Lloyd and if there isn't time, perhaps they can be saved and um, answered later. And also anyone watching on Facebook uh, can send in questions that way. So Lloyd, the question which actually is also a question I think I had when we were discussing your paper some time ago, um, there's a, a distinction, of course, between, um, well, the, you, you mentioned Shafi Kadkani's uh, term Kalandars. I mean, Kalandars are one thing, and Irfani sort of intellectual Sufis are something else. And is there any sense that uh, there's a distinction here in anybody's mind, or are they just branding it all Sufis as Sufis? I think that, that by and large, what tends to happen is that the travel writers do not make this distinction at all. I think the only person that really has a, a knowledge of what's going on really is Brown. Mm. You know, he's absolutely clear in his uh, literary history of Persia that, you know, we have these, these very remarkable poets. Uh, we have the idea of Erfan, but at, at the same time, he notes that uh, in his travel writings that, you know, we have these, these Galandars too. So there's obviously a recognition of, of differences of terms, but it, it, with the other travel writers, you just get these terms dervish and galandar completely interchangeable. Mm. There's absolutely no recognition at all about this distinction. Which and is so frustrating, not... but I mean, it's indicative really of a kind of like a, a, a lack of knowledge, lack of awareness and perhaps a lack of integration into the larger society when they went to Iran. Yeah. Yeah, so it makes their position very naive that they don't actually are aware that I mean, the ulama, you know, were criticizing the Sufis themselves long before anyone had heard of Edward Said. It's very much a, a homegrown debate as well, yeah. wasn't it? I, th I think it depends. It also depends on on which which reader that you look at. So, for example, when you look at the early nineteenth century works on the histories of Sufism you do get more of a, a sympathetic appreciation of the range of thinking and the types of various Sufi schools. But it's from the 1850s onwards that this travel writing seems to erupt. And it sees that become much, much more negative, seeing the, the Sufis simply as Galandas. Mm. And as I said in my presentation, I think, you know, we need to be careful with that and, and, and look at the context in which they, they lived and there's all kinds of things going on in terms of maybe a repression of Sufis by the ulama and there's the economic downturn but unfortunately I mean th these kind of things aren't mentioned. No well I have a question thank you uh, we have a question on um, from uh, Amir Tilhaba I suppose I pronounced that right how do positions of British Orientalists on Sufism in Iran compare with what Orientalists from Russia, Germany or France said? 
in other words, how integrated across national or imperial borders with these troops, uh, considering that Oriental studies were intensely transnational. So an interesting question. I, I think one way to, to, to look at that is to see what happens with, for example, the French. Mm. And the, the French are perhaps the, the drivers of this air in debate. So I think in many ways, uh, they were perhaps more culpable <laughs> than the British. Um, but uh, I haven't looked at the German sources. I haven't looked at the Russian sources simply because I don't have the linguistic ability. But certainly if, if you look at the French, then you, you get the same kind of the same kind of descriptions. Hmm. Thank you. Well, we have an anonymous attendee. Could you comment on Nicholson and Arbery and their attitudes towards Sufism? That's a, an interesting question. It's a little bit outside of the time frame from the presentation, but nevertheless, Arbery was interesting because Arbery was interesting in the respect that he he was more or less concerned with classical Sufism. And he saw Sufism as something that goes into decline, hmm. goes into massive decline. Um, so in, in that respect, you could say that Arbery was perhaps a conventional form of an Orientalist in the respect that, you know, it, Sufism is perhaps re reflective of a, of, a, of a glorious heyday of Islamic civilization, which cannot be recovered. Now, he didn't actually say that, but nevertheless, there are indications that, you know, well, what, 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 what's the obsession with this, this glorification of Sufism? In his defense, it could be argued that basically after the time of Jami, you know, it's very difficult to find something comparable in terms of literary value. And I suppose one of the interesting questions is why? And one of the interesting uh, solutions to this was suggested to me some time ago by Iraj Afshar. And he said, well, look what happens to Sufism. You know, you know it, uh, under the Seljuks, it was heavily patronized. The Sufis had Hanagars, you know, and then by the time of the Safavids, it's curtailed. You know, it, the Sufis were not, no longer patronized. They were vilified by many members of the ulama. And so it's only natural that, you know, you'll never get the same kind of literary flowering that happened under the Seljuk period. Mm. With regard to, 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 to Nicholson, I think Nicholson was perhaps much more sympathetic towards the Sufi tradition, uh, even more so also than Arbery. Uh, so Nicholson, in fact, uh, on many occasions, he refused to take a stand about the origins of Sufism. You know, he regarded this largely as a bit superfluous. Um, I think Nicholson was someone who, a bit like Massignon, in fact, regarded that Islam was a, a genuine manifestation of um, Islamic spirituality, even though it was probably influenced by what it had around it, whether it was Christian or, or Buddhist or Zoroastrian or whatever. But nevertheless, fundamentally, it grew out of this Quranic uh, root. I've got, uh, thank you. Uh, we've got a few more now. Andrew Newman says, thanks Lloyd. Were your writers aware of the different Sufi orders extant on the ground at the time? I suppose that's absolutely slightly not. the question. No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. The only, uh, the only person who shows a degree of interest in various Sufi denominations is Brown. Right. Um, aside from Brown, all the others that I've mentioned had no idea about Sufi diversity. Yeah, I expect that that's regarding the travel writers. Although I have to say that uh, Sir William Graham, who, who wrote the history of Sufism in the early part of the 19th century, he was based in, in India. So he had an awareness of different forms of Sufism in India. Now, whether he was aware of different forms of Sufism in Iran, whether historically or whether during his lifetime, it's not clear. But by and large, Andrew, uh, I have to say that Brown is the only one who has a significant knowledge of the Sufi tradition, and that includes both the living tradition and the historical tradition. Yeah. And Anthony Wynne, hi Anthony, says, how many Westerners do we know of at this time who experienced the Sufi life from the inside rather than observing it from the outside? 
sort of proto hippies. <laughs> in the 19th century, yes. oh, I, I don't know of any, to be honest with you. I mean, if anyone out there does know, please do let me know. I'd be delighted to to hear from you, and it'd be a, a fantastic uh, source of information. Brown was probably the nearest to went yeah, yeah, I mean, with his. Uh... Brown, Brown was a, a very interesting figure. I mean, if you read his uh, 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 account of his stay in Iran, you know he had access to all kinds of people, and he stayed with people of various shades, and he was you know, you know received hospitably. And that includes by uh, by 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 Sufis and dervishes uh, located basically in shrines and also on on, uh, on on traveling in traveling in caravans. But apart from Brown, like, I can't think of anyone who had access to to uh, any sources. And that that includes, I mean, when I say had access to any sources, I mean basically a lot of the travel writers um, were reliant on information from Iranians. I mean, they had limited knowledge of Persian, and so they had to rely on their sources, they had to rely on their hosts. And as I've intimated, um, you know, Iran in the 19th century, there wasn't a great deal of sympathy towards Sufis in, in the 19th century. You know, um, it's a guy called Reza Tarbande who wrote a, a thesis on uh, Persian Sufism in the 19th century, and he more or less concludes, you know, in the same kind of way that uh, Sufism was repressed in, in the 19th century by by the clerics. Mm. Of course, the difference with Brown is that he was a serious scholar, although that yeah. probably, uh, I mean, unlike a, just a casual traveller, I mean, although his scholarship developed later, really, but and also presumably his interest in um, barbarism must have triggered some sort of comparative he must have understood the milieu from which these things were coming in, in the way that uh, I guess the others didn't. Yeah. Well, uh, well Brown, for... Brown is interesting because, I mean, he, he mentions the, his own interest in Sufism before he went to Iran. At mm. one point, you know, he was working as a medic in London and he says in his time off, he found some kind of uh, inspiration, if you like, from reading the pantheistic poets, as he calls them. Mm. Uh, but there's no indication in Brown's writings later on even that he was particularly um, inclined towards Sufism. And in fact, if you read his literary history of Iran, basically, I mean, he, he's much more interested in historical works than specifically uh, mm. denominational Sufi works. Yeah. Feruza has a couple of comments. One is that Brown's counterpart uh, studying Sufism in Russian Oriental studies would be Zhukovsky. Yeah. I don't know how much of his work is uh, available to a non-Russian speaker, but he was uh, clearly a major figure at that period. And she also says, thanks Lloyd, how about the idea of Hafiz being invented by British Orientalists, first of all by Brown, some sort of Sufi prophet? Yeah, I, I, I'm sceptical of this. I mean, you know, you, ha you have to go back to look at the, for, for example, the, the manuscripts that were copied about Hafez or, or of Hafez's Divan. I mean, why were these, why were these made? I mean, it shows that Iranians themselves had a great predilection for, for Hafez. So, you know, when, when we look at his, his poetry, you know, you could say, is it Arafani? Is it not Arafani? Does it really matter? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. the, the, perhaps that's the, the whole beauty of it, that it, it kind of like balances on this borderline between the sacred and profane, if you like. Yes. The questions are piling up there, no doubt uh, stimulated by what's gone before. Ghulam uh, Mouin Adin, this may be rather a large question, Lloyd, you may defer this till next year. Is Sufism against the teachings of Islam or is it the true interpretation? of Islam. You may be, I uh, think, that's a short answer. In a sense, uh, you're there, discussing there, this there anyway. Are, there are a thousand true interpretations of Islam and uh, Sufism is perhaps just one of them. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It is clearly an aspect of Islam. And then we have Maxime Alontsev asks, was there any difference between the reception of Persian Sufism by British Orientalists who lived in Iran compared with those in India? Um, 
I don't know, is the honest answer. I mean, I haven't really investigated uh, a great deal and a number of, of British individuals who are in India. I mean, it, it, studying British uh, citizens in India will be a huge task simply because yeah. the number of them will be humongous compared to those who were in Iran. Yeah. You know, you have, you have to go through, through the records of the East India Company. Uh, so, you know, that's perhaps not, not a task for me at the moment, but it'd be quite an interesting uh, uh, investigation to do. Secondly, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I imagine that the kinds of Sufism that existed in India in the 19th century might have been very, very, very different from the types of Sufism that existed in Iran, simply because the, uh, the non-Islamic religious influence might have been that much greater on the mm -hmm. Sufism in India than in Iran. Yeah. I've got, I'm going to skip over Jake quickly because uh, Reza Tahir Kermani, who did a PhD in Bristol on Omar Khayyam. Hello Reza, long time no contact. Thanks for this interesting talk. I think the phrase better a live sparrow than a stuffed eagle needs to be read in the context of Fitzgerald's translation practice. It was after all included in a letter which Fitzgerald wrote to Carl only weeks after the publication of the Rubaiyat. Here Fitzgerald was simply describing and defending his translation method. The phrase is Fitzgerald's modest estimate of his achievement, but also a kind of boast. He's saying my method of translation makes no pretensions to grandeur, but at least it is alive. Yeah, I, I think I was perhaps a little too kind to, to Fitzgerald in some ways. Um, Arbery draws, draws attention to the fact that in the original of Chayam, whatever that means. In the original of Chayam, sometimes there are references to specific Islamic rituals and or Muhammad. And in the translations, Chayam, uh, sorry, sorry, Fitzgerald completely glosses over these. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some ways in which you could argue along this side that, you know, Fitzgerald is not being true to his subject and of course, it ties in with, with, with the quote about uh, the live sparrow and the stuffed eagle. But I just thought it was a, a nice quote and wanted to perhaps bring your attention to today's presentation by putting it out there. <laughs> right, well, Jake uh, Benson has um, uh, two points which I can link together. Dosson, that's uh, the famous French uh, um, Orientalist describes dervishes as Oriental Freemasons. Did such a portrayal circulate in Iran? And if so, were they positive or negative? I suppose this picks up what uh, Malcolm Khan might have been. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, this this is, is a kind of like an, an well, it's not an awkward question, but it's a question that um, defies a, a simple answer in the respect that, you know, there's still a, an argument even raging today among academics about this kind of idea about Freemasonry and Sufism. And this is particularly linked to an organization known as the Anjuman -e Ohuat, which existed during the Constitutional Revolution under an individual called Zahir al who was Nasruddin Shah's um, court minister. And he tried to reform Sufism, Imat uh, Sufism, by using the kinds of rituals and practices which were typically used by the Freemasons. Hmm. And so because of this association, there has been a continuing linkage, if you like, between Sufism in the modern period with Freemasonry. So, I mean, I, I don't really know enough about modern Persian Sufism in the 20th century. I mean, to be frank, you know, Persian Sufism in the 20th century hasn't really been politically anyway important. You know, so it hasn't had the strength in numbers, hasn't had the influence on society that Sufism used to have. So the linkage is, well, it's there, but is it really important? I'm not so mm. sure. We've got two or three questions about um, Richard Francis Burton. I don't know if the people asking questions can see the other people asking questions or if this just happens to have spontaneously come up. 
Uh, Matthew Rettino said, did Sir Richard Francis Burton become a Sufi? Jake Benson says Burton posed as an Afghan Sufi. And Isabel Miller says, is there any information about Richard Burton experiencing Sufi life? So uh, well, I, I know I nothing, have... I know nothing really about Burton to, to answer to the questions, but to make it perhaps relevant to the discussion, it was quite interesting that uh, you had images in the PowerPoint presentation of both E.H. Palmer and E.G. Brown in oriental clothing. And uh, what does that mean to say? I mean, you know, I, I, I can remember on one occasion being in Iran and I was challenged that E.G. Brown was a, a British spy, you know, and spent a year in Persian clothes. But actually, when you look at the photographs of, of Brown in Persian clothes, you'll notice that they were taken in a studio in England. Yes. So it appears that Brown just did it for the sake of his perhaps parents or, or whoever, you know, for, for a nice photograph. Um, but regarding Burton becoming a Sufi, I, I don't know. I don't know. No. Anthony Wynne uh, says Sykes spent a lot of time talking to the Nibbatullahi Sheikh at Mahan. Yeah and was very impressed by him. He had to hide this in his reports for fear of being thought to have gone native. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so this yeah. individual that Sykes met was in fact Safi Ali Shah. And Safi Ali Shah was the leader of the Nematalahi order. And he himself, Safi Ali Shah, was the, the spiritual leader or the sheikh of this guy called Zahir al Dalai that I've just mentioned. And so they both, uh, Safi Ali Shah and Zohir Dalai were both urbane individuals, well educated, and they both wanted to reform Sufism in the respect that they advised Sufis to get jobs, to dress, you know, neatly and to wash their hands and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it's perhaps a reflection of the modernizing period in which they found themselves, that they decided to perhaps, you know, I, I guess perhaps even conform to what might be considered to be uh, modern standards of the time. But yes, I mean, Sir Percy Sykes was uh, very much taken with um, Safi Ali Shah. What might turn out to be our last question? Um, no, there's another one suddenly arrived. Uh, Arazu says, uh, Arazu Azad, thanks very much, Lloyd. What can you tell us about female British Orientalists and what they might or might not have had to say about Sufism? There may not have been that many in the 19th century. But. The only person that, that I've come across in, in my um, presentation was uh, Lady Shield. Mm. And uh, she has a, a, a few... In fact, they, they, they seem to be contradictory um, words in, in her book because on the one hand, she calls them quite kind and polite and very nice. And yet like a, a few chapters, on, not a few chapters, a few lines on, she says, of course they're charlatans. <laughs> so, so what do you do? It's, it's very difficult. But, but in terms of sources, I mean, there are, aren't a great many um, sources that uh, were written by females for, for obvi obvious reasons. Yeah. Well, we have a question here, I'm not sure if it's, I'll ask it anyway, just for the sake of it. The anonymous attendee, I don't expect you to say an awful lot about it. Like, what's your take on the English translation of the Rubaiyat of the Makayam by Fitzgerald? I mean, you've already said that, uh, a bit about it. Uh, Fitzgerald's translation is, um, it, it's a piece of work which, in my opinion, reflects more about his own life than uh, a faithful translation of the Persian into English. I mean, it's all about uh, Fitzgerald trying to come to terms with his own context, you know. So I, I think it, it's nice if you want to read something which is all about Victorian Britain, but in terms of learning something about uh, a representation of Iran or Persia, forget it. It's not going to happen. No. Great. Well, um, unless something bursts into the Q&A box, um, I think it's a good moment to wrap up, which is uh, we're very nicely on time, just a few moments to go. So I'd like to thank Lloyd very much on behalf of that. And I think we've had a very uh, nice set of uh, interested questions and a, a good discussion arising out of this. So um, 
I think without more ado, Lloyd, I thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I think this is going to become an article or maybe already has become an article. Okay. Or, yeah. yeah, I'd uh, like so to, we'll... to, 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 to thank you. And I'd also like to thank Bips for giving me this opportunity. I should say that the, what I've written has been uh, read by both Charles Melville, by Paul Luft and John Gurney. So any mistakes or shortcomings are absolutely <laughs> their fault and not mine. <laughs> No, no, yeah, no. well, we we did our best to stop him, but it obviously <laughs> didn't. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, hang on, Farouz is just the last dig. Fitzgerald was translating in the same manner from French and Greek. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was basically about Fitzgerald and not about the sources. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Anyway, there we are. Thank you very much, Lloyd, and thank you very much for everybody. And um, in case you want to see this again, um, it's going to be, uh, it has been recorded uh, and will be available on um, YouTube uh, after uh, Sylvia has had a chance just to quickly edit it and make sure it's all okay. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.